Good morning to everyone this day. I'm glad you're joining in with the Sunday School lesson. We'll be in session two of our quarterly if you picked one up at church. If not, we'll be in Isaiah chapter six. Last week, we began our study of Isaiah, who was one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. There were several other prophets, and usually when they came onto the scene, they would begin their prophecies by explaining how they got their calling and their experiences of their calling with God. But for Isaiah, he basically took one verse and he basically said, I'm Isaiah, I'm bringing you a message from God and you people have really messed up. He took five chapters to review all that they had done that had displeased God over the years. He gave them an opportunity to make things right with God and then he proceeded to warn them of all the events and the tragedies they were facing if they chose to remain unfaithful to God and to ignore their responsibilities that were outlined in the covenant that God made with them. And from history, we know they did ignore Isaiah. Hindsight is always 2020, but they had gone to the edge of no return. We think of God as being a loving God and a forgiving God, but there is a limit and they had gotten to their limit. They were guilty on so many levels. Greed, oppressing the needy in their social uh, world, living a party life basically. They were guilty of spiritual blindness and arrogantly thinking that they were wiser than God. Isaiah warned the tides were going to change and those who had been greedy and gained wealth from oppression and unjust practices would become desolate. Those who were gluttons and drunkards would die of hunger and thirst. Life was not going to be easy in the years to come. In an effort to make it very clear and in a way that they could understand, Isaiah sang an allegorical song about a vineyard. In this vineyard, the owner represented God and the vines represented his chosen people. The owner had taken care of the land. He tilled it. He got the soil ready. He cleared away the stones. He planted not just any old kind of vine, but choice vines. He kept out the animals that could intrude and destroy the vineyard. And he would expect a great crop, but the grapes in the harvest were bitter and worthless. So the owner removed the protection that he had provided and he allowed the wild animals to come in and trample on that beautiful vineyard. God had prepared the land of Israel. He had removed the occupants or the stones that were in the way. He put his chosen people there, not just any group of people, his chosen people that he got out of slavery in Egypt. And he had guarded them from their enemies but they produced wickedness, injustice, and despair instead of good spiritual fruit. And so he was ready to allow foreign nations to overpower Israel. This was the, uh, the nation's condition when Isaiah was called by God. So it's important to know, I think, the background of where he's uh, coming to speak to his people. Isaiah immediately reviewed with the people all of their issues before he ever got to the part where God had seen enough and had needed someone to go warn his people. So we get down to chapter six before he finally tells the people how he became the prophet. And so for today, we'll start in chapter six with verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. At this time in history, the nation of Israel had been divided into the northern kingdom that was still called Israel, and the southern kingdom was known as Judah. Solomon was the last king that ruled over an undivided nation, and at the time of Isaiah, both nations had gone through several kings. Some were godly and some not so godly. And most recently, Jeroboam II had been king of Israel, but he had died about three years prior to this. And uh, the part of the nation, that part had seen economic growth. In fact, both parts, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom had seen economic growth, but they had also been involved in a golden calf cult or in idol worship. 
um, they had bad moral standards and a lot of social injustice. Uzziah was the most recent king of Judah where Jerusalem was and Isaiah was from this area. But the warnings that he gave applied to the northern kingdom and the southern sections. Both Isaiahs had seen some prosperous years, but both had a tendency to think that they were self-reliant and they became morally lax during times when things were going well for them and they had everything that they needed. We face the same temptations in our world. When times are tough, we can't get on our knees enough to pray to God. And then when troubles are dissipated, we get lazy in our communication with God. So Isaiah was called in the year that Uzziah died. And you might think, well, that's not a very important bit of information, but new leadership was going to take over. And anytime new leadership gets in place, it creates a little bit of anxiety and a sense of insecurity. So that's how the people were feeling at that time. That happens in all places, in our country, in every country, in jobs, a new job, a new boss takes over and you wonder how, the, how that's going to affect you. In churches, we get a new pastor and we wonder just what he's going to expect, how things are going to be different, what changes he's going to make. Any place that there is a position of leadership, there is anxiety and insecurity when the leadership role is taking a, a different turn. And even our children, when they face a new school year with a different teacher, they feel anxiety. And if they don't feel anxiety, the parents probably do. And so with a country, they may be, there may be a short window of time during the transition of leadership when the country is very vulnerable. And the people were now facing a growing threat from the Assyrians, which should have brought to mind the vineyard analogy that Isaiah had just told them about the owner of the vineyard removing his protection and allowing the wild animals to come in and destroy it. Anyway, Isaiah is telling of his calling that came to him in a vision. In this vision, God was seated on a throne. And now it didn't say if he was in the temple, he was on a throne and his presence filled the entire space. God was on the throne indicating that he was in control as he always is. He still is in control, but that did not mean that Israel and Judah were safe. So Isaiah continued to describe his vision in verses two through four. So we'll read those now. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. In Isaiah's vision, there were also some seraphim. That was a plural form, so we know that there had to be at least two. And other than that, we don't know how many. It doesn't really matter. But the root word for this title means to burn or burning ones, which may have indicated that they were bright and shiny or that they radiated some heat. But these uh, beings had three pairs of wings. Two sets were used to show respect to God by covering their face and their feet. And this was an accepted gesture when you were in the presence of royalty. And with the third pair of wings, they could fly. In our language, we have words that indicate a good, better, and best uh, description. In the Hebrew language, the superlative or the best was indicated by repeating a word three times. The seraphim sang, holy, 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 which declared that God was not only holy, he was most holy. He was not only above heavenly realm, but he was above everything on earth. He was above Israel, and Judah's armies. He was above the land, but he was also above Assyria and its armies as well. The praises of the seraphim were not whispers. They wanted heaven and earth to hear what they had to say. They were so loud, the foundations shook. Their praises were like thunderous. When we have a big peal of thunder, sometimes it feels like it rattles our windows and shakes our foundation. The room was filled with smoke, which was a common sight in the temple because of the burning of sacrifices and the incense. 
The sacrifices were an indication of the, the worship of the people, and the incense represented the prayer life of the believers. In this vision, though, all of the signs of worship originated from the seraphim, not from Israel or Judah, because in last Sunday's lesson, you know, we've already seen that God was displeased with their sacrifices because they were not genuine uh, representations of their worship. They were just rituals that they went through. They were habits. They were works of habits. So in verses five through seven, it shows Isaiah's reaction to all of this he saw in this vision. And it also tells what the seraphim did in response to his reaction. Then said I, and this is Isaiah speaking, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Isaiah's vision not only showed him the nature of God, but it also revealed to him his own sinful nature. He felt an overwhelming sense of inadequacy and fear that he was about to die because first of all, he said, I have seen the Lord of hosts and nobody saw God and lived. So he stated then that he was a person who had fallen short and had failed God and he lived among people who had done the same and maybe even more. So by seeing the purity of God in this vision, he realized how corrupt he and all the others were. But God was ready to provide a solution to Isaiah's woe and his distress. The only requirement for Isaiah was his confession of unworthiness, which he promptly did. He had no problem recognizing that in the presence of God. One of the seraphim took a coal from the altar and touched Isaiah's mouth and lips. The glowing coal served as a visual representation of the forgiveness and the cleansing that God had provided to Isaiah. And so far, all of Isaiah's experiences have been visual. But next, God actually began to speak in verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. It's usually around this time of the year that a nominating committee would be going around taking, uh, asking people if they would be willing to take a job at the church for the coming year. And some people would immediately answer with a yes. And some people will immediately answer with a no. But most that answer immediately with a yes do that because they already know that's where God has led them to serve. And some will respond that they want to pray about it. Now, this could mean that they really want to seek God's guidance. And for some, it may really mean, well, I really don't want to do that, so let me have some time to think of a good sounding excuse. And some may say, well, if nobody else will do it, I'll take it. Well, that's not the half-hearted kind of response that God wants from his people. And when we do say yes, he wants us to fulfill our responsibilities. The people of Israel had a responsibility to the covenant with God. And when you accept a job at church, then God expects you to fulfill the responsibilities that come along with that job. So, but did you notice how Isaiah responded? God didn't even really specifically ask Isaiah. It appears to me that he was thinking out loud. God was thinking out loud. Well, I've got this mission. I need somebody to do it. Let me think of the people on my list that are possibilities. Who shall I send or whom shall I ask? Well, of those that are possibilities, who do I think would be willing to go? Now, let me see. So Isaiah hears God's voice and he says, me, here I am, send me. 
He didn't say, well, God, if you can't find anybody else, I guess I can go. He was like the kids in school from a long time ago. I know it's not happening now, but they would volunteer to go beat the erasers. If you're old enough, you know that when uh, chalkboards were used in the classrooms, the erasers would sometimes get so full of chalk that they didn't do a good job erasing. So the teacher would be looking about the classroom, trying to find somebody that she could send outside to beat the erasers on the pavement or on the pump house. That's what we did on the pump house or on a tree trunk. And everybody in that room would be raising their hand and bouncing in their seats because everybody wanted that job. Isaiah was volunteering with that kind of eagerness. He didn't even stop to ask what the mission was or where he would be going or what he'd be saying or who he'd be talking to. He was just ready to do it for God. God had forgiven and cleansed him, and that's the least he could do for God. When God did give the directive though, I'm sure it was pretty confusing because he told Isaiah to go to his people Tell them to keep listening, but don't understand. and Keep looking, but don't see the message. God knew they were so used to ignoring his requirements that no amount of reminding is going to prompt them to make a change. He knew the people had already made their choice, and any kind of repentance that they voiced at that point would not be genuine, and he did not want that. So at this time, you can expect that any excitement or enthusiasm that Isaiah felt when he first said, me, send me, let me go, it must have plummeted. But in the next verses, in 11 through 13, it gives just a little bit of clarification. It says, then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. That's not a pretty picture. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be substance thereof. Isaiah was pretty dumbfounded, and he wanted to know, well, how long am I going to continue this task if it's not going to do any good? You can imagine how disheartening a task this would be. But God's answer was not so encouraging, but it did offer just a little glimmer of hope. He said there would be almost complete destruction before the punishment ended, and Isaiah was to keep warning until that time. Most of those who survived would be carried away in exile, and we do know that uh, Israel was carried away to Assyria and Babylon, Babylon. But a tiny bit of encouragement came when God said a tenth would be left in the land. They would face more problems, but they would be God's substance to sprout new life. They would be like the stump of a giant tree that had been cut down. The part that was cut away would be used for firewood, but the stump still had life in it, and it would germinate and it would grow again. And that remnant, that remained in the land would be refined more. And because of that, the people of God would be renewed. They would return to the Lord and they would be restored to the promised land. Now, we're all like Isaiah. We stand in need of God's forgiveness. In Isaiah's vision, the fiery coal offered the atonement for his sins but we have Jesus on this side of the cross who enacted the atonement on our behalf. Isaiah's response to God's call on his life was an example of the logical and appropriate response that every believer should have then, today, tomorrow. Our challenge for today may be then to compare our responses to God with the response that Isaiah gave. I want to thank you for joining today. And let's all keep our prayer life active, alive, and well. Our country is going through some trying times and pretty soon we'll be in a transition state on some level. And I pray that all of you will stay safe and help keep others safe. Once again, thank you for joining today.